Hi, Bradley. Oh, good hello. afternoon, everybody. Oh, hello. Hello. How are you today? Good afternoon. Doing fine, thank you. I'm actually calling in from Brazil, so there may be some unusual wow. tropical noises on the microphone. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, like Embedded Fest now became truly international com uh, conference. <laughs> so we are now I'm streaming global. almost from all the continents. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, so Bradley, uh, you have quite <coughs> exciting presentation prepared for our participants today. So if you are ready, please start. I'm ready. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. We're going to be talking about how we use open source software, open source communities uh, to accelerate innovation, particularly in the areas of computer vision, edge computing, and, and related subjects. Right? So uh, let's get into it. I've got uh, a number of projects that we'll be talking about. Um, and we'll have some links, and I think there's a chance to, to chat afterwards. I can share some of the links as well. So uh, let's just jump in. I don't know where everybody in the room is with the word edge and edge computing. It's a fairly new term. Uh, it's also very context specific, depending on what audience you're talking to, you can all agree on one definition of the word edge. Uh, but from the perspective that I take, uh, edge computing is putting the actual computation as close to the source of data as possible. So there's two ways to think about the cost of data. One is the time it takes for the data to move to the compute that's going to do the analytics. The other is the bandwidth capabilities. So you may have remote computing on an oil platform in the middle of the ocean, or you may simply just have a lot of hops to get to the cloud. You know, depending on the use case, those costs may be a very serious consideration and so the whole idea of edge compute is putting uh, the analytics, putting the computation as close to the source of the data in order to remove the latency cost or the bandwidth cost. Uh, the photos here are from one of Walmart, which is a big uh, American uh, international retailer. Uh, their uh, kind of future of retail lab their intelligent retail lab where they installed racks and racks of uh, servers and GPUs in the store so that customers could walk up to the window and see all of the compute. And this is where they were experimenting with using video cameras to measure inventory levels, uh, to understand the customer experience and more. So I think the edge computing really starts to be popular when you get into video because there's just so much data that's in video. And once you get beyond, say, nine or 10 cameras, you can start to overwhelm traditional enterprise, you know, long haul networks. So, you know, this is a kind of a visual description of the continuity of compute. When you consider today's current trends around cloud computing as a destination from enterprise applications, so the typical enterprise data center deciding that they want to move certain applications to the cloud, those are in the right two columns. Uh, then you have the IoT devices on the very far left. And so these represent typically the things, the, the small items that are producing the data. It could be a camera, uh, it could be a robot, uh, it could be a temperature sensor, a cash register, point of sale, or it could be a number of things. Now, some of those devices may have their own compute capabilities. Some of them may be on the slimmer side and all they do is produce data. but Assume that we have compute very near that device. Uh, we have a form factor we call it edge appliance. So this would be an on-premises server. Maybe it's a very low-end server, just a couple of compute cores and some networking capability. Uh, but you might consider, you know, what are the kinds of computation I want to do on the edge? And so maybe we are watching the camera stream to detect if we have enough employees uh, based on the number of customers that we have. Um, but typically we're looking for the kinds of analytics that need fast turnaround uh, so that we can impact or improve um, you know, the, the use case that we're trying to, to measure in the business. Uh, we're not actually making an argument that edge is an alternative to the cloud, that you, know, you need to choose edge or you need to choose cloud. It's a spectrum. 
you need to choose where the compute should go based on the requirements you have. Do you have time sensitivity? Do you have bandwidth cost sensitivity? Do you have compute cost sensitivity? Uh, edge computing, cloud computing, enterprise computing all have different compute costs. All of those have to be taken into consideration. But my ask is that when you start considering system level architectures, you need to start considering all of those factors, time cost, bandwidth cost, compute cost, and be ready to flex on where the use case should deploy. And the odds are you'll be wrong the first time and you need to try again. So maybe you tried an edge experiment, but actually it works better in the cloud. Or maybe you tried a cloud experiment, but I think this works better at the edge. So you want to invest in the tools that help you quickly move between these. We're looking for commonality. And that's where I want to spend a moment talking about embedded computing versus the edge. Because we've been putting computers on premises for decades, right? We've had uh, computers and automobiles doing all sorts of embedded control right next to the sensors, you know, for decades. So there's nothing new about calling this edge computing uh, in the sense that, you know, you know, wow, we have a computer, we put it in the store, all of a sudden we call it edge computing, give me more money because I'm fantastic now. But the idea is that the type of computing is what's signified by edge computing. So if you look at the last 20 years of where enterprise computing has migrated to the cloud, we've gone from enterprise servers with one application per server, then we started over subscribing those servers by using virtual machines so we could deploy more applications per server. And then we started moving to scalable container-based applications. And in some cases, we moved all the way to serverless where we're just using, you know, oceans of functions, uh, you know, functions of service where we're just responding to, to triggers. And that's a pretty fantastic migration of technology if you look back just 15 or 20 years. And our argument is that embedded computing will have a similar migration. Now, I don't think it'll go through all of the steps that enterprise computing went through because we do see in VMs today and we already see some people experimenting with containers today and not everything will need serverless. But my argument is that edge computing should use these same tools, technologies and, and techniques that our cloud computing ecosystem is driving because it's going to help us find employees, right? We'll find the developers that know the technologies. It'll create consistency in your own development teams. You can adopt things like DevOps consistently across these projects. And that diagram I just showed with the IoT on the left and enterprise computing on the right, if you're using the same tools with the same teams, then you can quickly migrate your applications across that spectrum with more consistency. I'd say one big difference between cloud computing and edge computing, there's many differences. The biggest difference I think is a definition of the word scale. When you think of a company like Netflix who needs to instantly scale up services on demand for a Friday evening of movie watching, uh, on the embedded side, we don't typically have spikes in compute consumption. You can, I'm not saying you won't have them, but it's not as dramatic as our cloud partners have to worry about. But we do have a different problem, which is um, what I call edge scale. How do we quickly deploy these applications, quickly integrate them, find data across all these diverse data sources? How do we update the applications? How do we create those experiments? So we can copy this cloud behaviors of A-B testing and understanding what works better and what doesn't. And we wanna do that through using those same tools. Let's use container-based microservices. Let's go for orchestration, but when we can, we'll go for local orchestration. Uh, so we can operate when we're offline. And let's even go for clustering, but understand that we're going to have tiny clusters because we're only going to have one, two, three nodes in an edge environment. I put a link in here, you can Google it. I have an article um, I published on LinkedIn uh, where I talk about the behaviors, the practices that change when you consider edge computing. Because the, you know, the concept of putting analytics somewhere is not new but the practices that come along with these new, uh, new, new mentalities for edge computing is what your team has to start getting prepared for. I think that in general, there's three ways that customers who utilize technology will find their way to the edge, in the particular, this kind of edge computing. Our cloud vendors are already building their roadmaps. Uh, in China, we have multiple cloud service providers
that have we have multiple cloud providers uh, uh, that are starting to demonstrate capabilities from cloud edges. Vendors uh, are starting to show these same kinds of concepts. So a lot of people are already deploying our Cisco routers. Right? We've already got our, our networking stack that we're deploying on premises. And generally speaking, they're still based off of you know, x86 servers. And so they're pretty easy to scale by deploying a few more containers and you can put workload specific uh, capabilities on networking devices. And the third path uh, typically is a little more niche. And by niche, I mean very narrow. Maybe you're an industrial customer and your preferred vendor, your automation vendor is building an edge to cloud architecture utilizing these, these capabilities for purposes of flexibility and orchestrating their software. Um, or maybe you have a reason where you're building your own. You want to build your own stack from top to bottom uh, as part of your strategy. Uh, but I think these three paths are probably the way that most customers will find their way to edge computing, either following their cloud roadmaps, their network roadmaps, or a particular vendor um, that they've really started adopting their software from. So as independent ISVs, as independent developers, what's nice is you can use the same tools to address all of those, container-based microservices with orchestration technologies similar to the cloud. Uh, so now let's go into computer vision a little bit. Uh, I take a very generic definition of computer vision. It's basically using software to extract useful information from uh, video frames, photos, images, or, or videos. Uh, this diagram is an example of semantic segmentation where the idea is I'm going to give you a frame. I want you to tell me in that particular video frame where everything is. Tell me where the road is. Tell me where the car is. Tell me where the sign is. And typically with semantic segmentation, you use that information. Now, if you want to read the details on the sign, then you use the, the, the sign area and you crop to it and you provide another layer of analytics to extract the text from it. What I didn't call out specifically is whether you need to do deep learning or whether you can use traditional computer vision techniques because those are specifics. But in general, I, I, I put them all under the envelope of computer vision uh, and they can all be quite challenging. Uh, I will spend most of my time describing kind of a deep learning style of computer vision where we're training models. And this is this eight steps here as kind of the average day in the life of someone trying to deploy computer vision at the edge. Right, not necessarily technically specific here, but one of the hardest things to do is to procure a model, to go find a model that fits your need or to train it because training it means you need to find the data that trains it. You need to build the expertise to take existing models and then uh, you know, fine tune them or extend the training, transfer the training into your, your finished model. But here's where it starts to get doubly hard for the edge. If you're working in the cloud, you can have this life cycle all done in the cloud. You find your data, you train it, you copy the model from one server to another and you use your model in the cloud. But the point of edge computing is we need to get these models out to you know, thousands of stores, hundreds of hospitals, hundreds of factories, right? And these are you know, miles and miles and miles away, maybe even requiring flights. Uh, we can't afford just to keep sending people and trucks every time we have to update one of these models. Now, once you have the model deployed on premises, you still need to find and connect to your cameras, your video sources. You need to pre-process the video streams because the complexity of most models is that you have particular color space, particular um, uh, color ordering of the images, particular frame sizes, maybe particular frame rates that are required. And so this is just busy work that you have to do to pre-process all of your images. Uh, then you actually have to analyze the video. So you have to find the framework that's going to do the video analytics for you. Once you've done the video analytics, you've got your insights. Now you have to think about how you're going to send those events to other applications, how it's going to play as part of your system architecture, or maybe you have to send it to the cloud. How are you going to take a response to that video? Number seven, not every event will be clear. Maybe it's not a positive. Maybe it's not a negative. Maybe it's in the middle. Maybe you uncovered a new uh, event that you have to go retrain. So you have to collect that data. And then go back to step one. You've got your new data. Now you have to keep training or try to get a new model. Right? So these eight steps are kind of the basic, you know, uh, continuous loop that you have to do to keep practicing with computer vision in the edge. But I call out a particular couple of pain points. 
Um, computer vision quality is one of the biggest challenges that we'll have because we have to make sure we have a good algorithm that we've trained good data to train from, um, that we understand corner cases. Uh, if you ever want to validate someone's maturity with computer vision, and your anyone is telling you how, how wonderful they are, uh, if they ask, or if they start talking about, you know, I trained a model that worked on the first try, and you say, okay, did you try it at sunset? No, we never tried it at sunset. Did you try it at sunrise? No, we didn't try it at sunrise. Did you try it on a cloudy day? No, we didn't try it on a cloudy day, but it worked in the sunny day that we, at, at two o'clock in the afternoon, it worked fine. Uh, you have to understand that, that those create reflections and glare at eight in the morning, that's different than two in the afternoon. And this can be really challenging for uh, teams to get through. Um, and then the last challenge around quality is where you're getting your data from. If you're going to market these models professionally, you have to understand the source of the data used to train the models. And you have to understand if they had licenses from any people that were in the videos uh, to use their image as part of, of your model. And so pract practicing on the bench, playing around in the lab, it's one thing, but if you want to go deploy uh, a model into a retail environment, getting paid by retail customers, uh, these are very serious issues that you have to consider both on the preparation of the data and the, the sourcing of that data. And then that second bucket is around scale, right? Scale challenges. You've got a thousand stores that you need to deploy this to. How do you find your cameras? How do you automate turning on the camera streams? And then how do you uh, automate handling those events and combining it with your other applications? And then lastly, um, your data will keep changing. Your models will keep changing. How are you pushing those updates? You know, in the old version of embedded computing, we rewarded teams for keeping compute fixed and functional, right? Our only measurement was uptime. Uh, if you're in a retail environment, did you keep the cash registers running on the busiest shopping days of the year? In this particular model, it's more like the cloud. How quickly can you deploy a new piece of software? and have the confidence that you didn't break something else. And if you did break something else, how quickly can you unwind and redeploy the older software? Right? And that's where that orchestration technology comes in and becomes so important. Uh, so let's start talking about some of the fun projects that, that we use daily in order to, to play in this space. So I haven't really said it explicitly, but one of my goals is that we create we create technologies that people can adopt. So the hard parts and the boring parts are done as part of the project, allowing you, the expert, to focus on either your market or your customer problem or the use case, but not having to solve the boring stuff that, that's the same for everybody. And so that's where we have a project like Video Analytics Serving. So Video Analytics Serving, uh, was primarily written by a team at Intel, but it's open sourced in the in the links. I've got the, a link to the GitHub, but you can also you can also Google it. Uh, but what they've done is they've taken uh, basically GStreamer pipelines, uh, and then they've created a REST API around them, so you have a pipeline manager, and you can use that REST API to quickly scale up and scale down, or start, stop, or modify pipelines uh, as if they're microservices. So you can use all the same mentalities of managing microservices to manage your, your computer vision pipelines. And this particular diagram is ex an example of a dog detector that's using a computer vision pipeline to look for a dog. And it's also using an audio pipeline to do an event detection to determine if a dog is barking, because maybe you need both uh, in order to under, you know, have high confidence that a dog is, is currently um, attacking your customers. And so you can have these pipelines generate metadata overlaid on the actual image, or more typically you're generating JSON that you're publishing back to some pub sub bus so that you can uh, subscribe to those events and utilize them. But what's interesting is it's not just GStreamer, uh, they've adopted Intel's OpenVINO toolkit for deep learning streamer, 
it's a it's based on GStreamer, but we've added particular elements to make it easy to do object detection, uh, to make it easy to do um, uh, object recognition, and there's multiple other uh, instant models that are already in there. Uh, and they've built some uh, extensive uh, capabilities. You have a generic Python element, so if every every frame of video or frame of audio that comes to the pipeline, you can have custom Python code that is executed for your own purposes. Maybe you have to interact with another system or you've got your own open CV algorithm you want to run, something specific that you can do in Python. Uh, and it's all meant to be scripted with pipeline configurations. So you have a set of elements from GStreamer. You can then create a JSON file where you record the pipelines. Um, you record the sources and syncs if you want, or optionally, you can let the REST API specify those. And then that becomes your pipeline zoo. And you just go into the service and you say, hey, I need this computer vision pipeline. Spin it up now. This is the pipeline template I want to use. Point at this camera, point the results at this pub sub bus. And you have a pipeline that's running. So again, not as useful when you're experimenting, when you're on the bench trying to see if it works, but fantastically useful if you're trying to deploy to a thousand stores because now you can automate these actions to fire up the pipelines. The pipelines still need to talk to things. And we call out EdgeX Foundry as one of our um, go-to IoT platforms, open source based, again, microservices based. The diagram is complex, but just understand that only the dark blue elements are required to run the four the sets of four microservices in the middle we call core services. Everything else is editorial decision. You can include if you want to or exclude if you want to. It's kind of like a Linux kernel. Um, you can configure your own Linux kernel, but typically you, you download someone else's pre-configured kernel. Uh, and then all the device services along the bottom are your connectors. These are your device connectors. This is where you abstract your protocols. And then along the top are typically your application services where you're interacting with other systems around you or above you. So we kind of a north-south configuration. Um, it's, it's quite nice from abstracting protocols. Uh, what we're doing right now is we're investing in capabilities around ONVIF camera detection, video for Linux camera detection, even real sense camera detection, so that we can discover them, rediscover them, manage the metadata, and create a common set of services. So you can just ask, you know, show me all of the cameras you've discovered. Show me all the cameras with metadata security, hashtag security. And then once you have those, you say, give me the URLs for these cameras, uh, and then you can start streaming from those cameras. So it's all meant to automate and help you scale out there. So we kind of forget that cameras are IoT devices. We think of thermostats, we think of pumps and controls and valves as IoT devices, but the cameras are IoT devices uh, that we can we can manage as well. Uh, what's interesting, it was a coincidence, I didn't notice until this afternoon, that Jim White is presenting in the next session, but in the other track, on EdgeX Foundry. So if you're curious about the IoT platform, he has an entire 40-minute you know, session on EdgeX uh, that you can dig into. Uh, so Jim is the CTO of IoTech, and he's the technical chair of the EdgeX Foundry um, uh, project at the Linux Foundation. So that should be a fantastic presentation. And then maybe not as popular uh, because it's, it's a little more niche and a little newer, but Tibco Software has open sourced an entire framework called Flogo, and the URL is flogo.io. And what they've built is basically a cloud in a box. Um, they have an event driven architecture uh, that you can start to send uh, events into and create triggered events uh, to make it easy to start creating the concepts of flows and streams. Uh, but essentially, the way I look at it, it's a fantastic integration engine. You can have your serverless functions here. Uh, you can have your event-driven architecture here. This can be your integration layer because of its yeah, architecture. They have a concept of triggers, which are uh, pieces of software that respond to events and other systems. And they have activities, and these are pieces of software that perform a function. So a trigger might be uh, watch a pub sub bus for a topic, uh, and then when you see it, 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 it enacts the triggers enacted and starts calling on the activities. And the activity might be take the data, uh, transform the image into black and white, 
and then call a, a TensorFlow serving service to do some artificial intelligence analytics on, on the data. And that's all done in a low-code environment. They basically go in and modify some JSON files. There's also a, a user interface that's web-driven. Uh, but once you click build or generate, uh, it takes those JSON files and compiles them into um, Golang-based binaries that will run natively on Windows, Linux, and I believe Mac, but don't, don't quote me on that. Uh, so you can have native bare metal execution. You can also have it automatically built into containers so that you can now have your microservices deployed with containers, uh, and then you can fire them up using Docker Compose uh, or whatever container orchestration you prefer. Uh, but it makes for a really neat, lightweight, event-driven architecture with Golang-based microservices, and it's extensible. They have templates for adding your own triggers. They have templates for adding your own activities, and you can do whatever you want you know, past that. But when you combine those three projects I just went over, Flogo, Video Analytics Serving, and Edgex Foundry, uh, TIBCO has created a, a project, Air. And Project Air takes the values of those three open source projects and it lets you discover the devices from EdgeX Foundry. Um, and so you can automate uh, the discovery of that data and, and pull it into streams. Uh, it integrates processing video from video analytics serving. Uh, and it uses Flogo to create the glue between all of these capabilities. And in a no code environment, it allows you to drag and drop your data. So it looks like code red when you look at it, you'll see the, the boxes or node red with the boxes with your connectors. Um, but once you create your data flow and you click deploy, it builds everything as a container. And then using an edge agent on that particular box, it will figure out all of the infrastructure required uh, and the services required and it will push those containers down to the edge, or I should say the edge pulls the containers down, and then fires up the containers, and you have that pipeline running. But what's nice about it is, now you can go back into the user interface, add a second pipeline, click deploy, and you have another set of analytics running. It's not meant for software engineers, particularly. It is meant for a business subject matter expert uh, who does not have to make a change request to IT, doesn't have to find an ISV to uh, go create a new piece of custom software. But if you have Project Air running at your edge box, uh, then you can quickly you know, drag and drop new pipelines and deploy them. Uh, so here's where I mentioned it looks a little bit like Node Red, uh, but the point is that you have data sources, you have pipes, you have notifications, uh, you can call other RESTful services. Uh, and it does kind of combine everything. You have the low code side uh, that makes your software engineering challenges a little easier. You have the no code side, uh, which should allow your business matter, subject matter experts to deploy their next use case. Um, and then when you combine no code with edge orchestration, uh, you now unlock edge computing to the average business user with organizations you know, around the world. Uh, what I want to call out here before I move on is there's a step function to edge computing. If there's no computer in the environment, you do have to go deploy a new computer. Um, and if it's a new computer, you do have to get it into an orchestrated network or make it part of a cluster. Uh, so there's kind of a step function of all these things you have to do to deploy your first application. When you use something like Project Air or another orchestrated solution, uh, you can break that down into digestible steps. You can use um, FIDO device onboarding. So the system wakes up, phones home to the server, and it gets attached to a management server. You can use IBM's um, open source, uh, um, Open Horizons, which is a pull-based orchestration so that you log into that orchestrator and it starts pulling down policies and Project Air supports Open Horizon, so you can orchestrate through a pull-based uh, solution. But the goal is to make those challenges bite-sized, solve a problem, solve a problem, solve a problem. And then with these kinds of no-code tools, the use cases just keep coming. The second use case 
doesn't have to worry about all those other problems. The third use case doesn't have to worry about those other problems. You just keep adding value and keep you know, solving problems for, uh, for your, your customers. So we actually have uh, we, Intel speak, it's called a reference implementation. Uh, but you can go to GitHub today and the, the link is in the summary. And you can download what we call real-time sensor fusion for loss prevention. So it uses RFID, scales, barcode readers, computer vision, and it approximates, simulates what it's like when a, a customer is shopping at a self-checkout and they, they put the bananas on the scale, but they say it's potatoes. And you say, well, no, 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 no. The computer vision says these aren't potatoes. Okay, fix the problem. Okay, it's banana. Put it in the basket. So it, it uses all of these sensors in the way of sensor fusion where you can analyze the data simultaneously to decide if it's a good transaction or a bad transaction. We're actually working through a project at the Open Retail Reference Architecture, part of EdgeX Foundry, Open Retail Reference Architecture, ORRA, where we're taking this concept of self-checkout loss prevention, sensor fusion, and we're building it on top of um, TIBCO's project error. And we're open sourcing the whole thing as a reference architecture that will include booting from a fresh node, uh, logging into the orchestrator for the first time as a fresh node, and then pulling down the Project Air agent, and then pulling down uh, the use case built on Project Air on top of it. So we'll go from fresh boot of a box all the way to fully deployed microservices doing computer vision analytics, as well as the other, other sensor types supported by this. That's an open community. We have multiple companies participating. We invite you to join, <clears throat> provide your experience, either working with customers or customer use cases, uh, or with the, the, the capabilities that you want to extend this with. So we meet every other week. Um, you can go to the GitHub, follow that. You can get back to the wiki, or you can Google for the wiki, and you can get to the GitHub. Uh, it's coming soon. It hasn't been published in its entirety yet, but we'll get there. We'll get there pretty quick. So this is the open retail reference architecture. I forgot to put the link in there. I think I have it on the last page. <clears throat> so in conclusion, um, these are some pretty difficult problems we want to solve. But difficult is good. Difficult is value. If we can solve it, we can get rewarded by our customers. right? And so as a software vendor, um, as a system integrator, uh, anything that helps you move faster to solve those problems, I think is a good thing. And so our takeaway, one of our core beliefs on our team is don't do the boring stuff. Let's invest in open source communities uh, where the community can maintain the boring stuff and maintain the hard stuff that we don't have to multiply a hundred times across a hundred companies. Let one open source project do that for us and then use our time after we quickly integrate them to solve the real problem that distinguishes one company from another. So if I want to focus on healthcare, you want to focus on, on retail, someone else wants to focus on hotel property management, that's great. We can all use the same basic ingredients and go solve and compete and, and succeed um, collectively across the market. Uh, that second bullet, I called it out earlier, don't just solve this problem. Think already about what's the second problem. If you hand build an IoT platform, I can just use MQTT. I have a couple sensors. It's no problem. Oh, I can just use uh, an application I wrote. Uh, you know, a, a Perl script, will, it'll just work. Start thinking about what happens when you have a thousand edge compute sites. What happens when you have three use cases, four use cases, 10 use cases, when you go from one camera to 10 cameras to 100 cameras, right? I think there's more value in solving for that scale than there is for proving that you could watch a, a, a temperature sensor to determine if a, a refrigerator was, was getting too warm. So solve for today's problem, but invest so you're solving for tomorrow's problem too. And then try to look through your team look through your customers' teams and understand how or explore how those people and how those teams are going to be using these capabilities. Um, and so you can then lead their innovation journey. 
So you can get them more quickly from a simple question. Huh, I wonder if I can measure how many people come in during the lunch break. Well, actually it's really easy for us to do because you've already invested in these platforms. We already have the cameras. Let's just pick door cameras and we'll quickly do a people counter based on door cameras. And I can email you the results uh, at the end of every shift because we have the triggers and we have the data pipelines we can just deploy. That's an exciting way to respond to someone's question as opposed to saying, well, I can get six software developers. We can listen to the problem. Uh, we'll see if we can find the cameras. We have to send some trucks out to add the compute. Uh, you know, let's go for that accelerated path as opposed to the, uh, this is gonna be hard just to solve a simple question. Uh, so here are, I'll, I'll kind of stop here and I'll leave these links up. Um, the first link at the top is Flogo. That was the kind of uh, cloud in a box project. And then Project Air is TIBCO's uh, project where we're integrating those three capabilities. Video analytics serving, I have the GitHub link. EdgeX Foundry, I have the, the top level domain link. Um, we've got the current real-time sensor fusion GitHub link. Uh, we've got uh, a link to the uh, wiki for the open retail reference architecture where I invite you to join us. Uh, the schedule is published there. You could subscribe to the calendar through the, through the wiki. Uh, I've got a link to my article uh, around changing behaviors for uh, adopting um, kind of cloud-based technologies as part of your edge architecture. And then uh, the last two links uh, is the, an article uh, from 2019 talking about Walmart using edge computing uh, in one of their retail showcases. And what's interesting about it is one of their objectives was to try to get customers comfortable with the amount of cameras and the amount of compute so they understand the kind of value that's being connected back. So it's a nice article to read. And then if you want to follow me or keep the conversation going, uh, please feel free to, uh, to find me on LinkedIn. Uh, and I think with that, uh, that's the end of the presentation. So I appreciate everybody's time. Um, I, you know, I'm happy again to dial in and uh, share these thoughts with you. These are active projects that we're still investing in across multiple companies. So please uh, reach out if you want to participate, you know, find these communities directly, or if you have any doubts, you know, go ahead and, and find me and I'll help point you along the way. Uh, but uh, I think it's within reach that you can easily deploy some computer vision based algorithms uh, at the edge with some really, you know, cutting edge architectures around um, cloud native technologies deployed at the edge. So I uh, encourage you to uh, dig deeper and, uh, and come aboard some of these projects. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Bradley. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge, experience, and support in Embedded Fest. It was a wonderful background uh, of your talk, by the way. Bird singing, it's like, sounds amazing.